الحمد لله الذي كان بعباده خبيرا بصيرا وتبارك الذي نزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض ولم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك وخلق كل شيء فقدره تقديرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون اعلموا أن خير الكلام كلام الله عز وجل وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أجارا الله وإياكم منها The hour is near Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He said in the authentic hadith Bu'ithtu ana wa sa'ah kahatayn I have been sent with the hour like these two And Allah azza wa jal He tells us in His glorious book After a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim Iqtarabati s-sa'atu wa n-shakka al-qamar The hour has drawn me and the moon has split. My dear brothers, there is no doubt that we are at the end of time. And Rasulullah he spoke about his time being close to the end of time. So what can we say about ourselves after 1400 years that has passed? We are even closer to the end of time. Many of the minor signs have already appeared. And the other signs that have not appeared from the minor, it will come with the major and even after. And there is no condition that the ulama have laid that all the minor have to happen before the major occurs. When Rasulullah described that the Kaaba will be destroyed brick by brick, this is when there is no more Muslims on the face of the earth. And we know this is from the last things that happen when the breeze will be sent and every believing soul shall taste death. My brothers and sisters in Islam, what is it that we await? Do we await for the major, major signs to happen in order for us to reflect? Do we wait? until we see with our eyes that which Rasulullah, that which Allah Azza wa Jal has described to happen? Well, if that is the state, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, then be careful. Because this is a description given by Allah to those who are heedless to His command, to those who disbelieve in what Rasulullah has stated. So beware, my dear brother and sister, from having a trait of the traits of the disbelievers. And that is delaying and delaying until you see with your own eyes. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says to us in His glorious book, أو يأتي بعض آيات ربك يوم يأتي بعض آيات ربك لا ينفع نفسا إيمانها لم تكن آمنت من قبل أو كسبت أو كسبت في إيمان 
إيمانها خيرا قل انتظروا إنا منتظرون Listen to these words from Allah Azza wa Jal That which its meaning translates to Do they then wait for anything other than that the angels should come to them? Are you waiting for the angels to come to you to take your soul? Or that your Lord should come, their resurrection? Or that some of the signs of your Lord should come? The day that some of the signs of your Lord do come, no good will it do to a person to believe then if he believed not before, nor earned good by performing deeds of goodness or righteousness through his faith. Say, O Muhammad, wait. We are waiting to. So the scary thing, my dear brothers and sisters, is to live in that state where we are awaiting the sign, the major sign to come. Where we are awaiting for the angel of death to come. Where we are awaiting that which already we should have certainty about because it has been mentioned to us by Allah and by His Prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the authentic hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he warned us of a Dajjal. He says, Ya ayyuhal nas, and this is while he was giving a sermon, and his sermon was all about a Dajjal. Ya ayyuhal nas, innahu lam takun fitnatun fil ardi, mundhu dhara allahu dhariyata adam, أعظم من فتنة الدجال. O mankind, there has never come to mankind any trial that is greater since the day Allah created the creation, greater than the trial of الدجال. وإن الله تعالى لم يبعث نبيا بعد نوح عليه السلام إلا حذره أمته. And Allah Azza wa Jal did not send the Prophet after Nuh alayhi salam except that he warned his nation about him. <coughs> Subhanallah. From the time of Nuh until Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, such a long time, and every Prophet was warning his people of a Dajjal. وَأَنَا آخِرُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَأَنْتُمْ آخِرَ الْأُمَمِ And I am the last of Prophets. And you are the last of nations. And he will appear from among you. There is no doubt. And there is nothing to avert that. And if he was to appear while I am in between you, then I am your, your, his opponent for every one of you. I will stand before every one of you. And defend. وَإِنْ يَخْرُجْ مِنْ بَعْدِ فَكُلُّ مْرِئٍ حَجِيجُ نَفْسِهِ And if he was to appear after me, then every person is responsible for himself. وَاللَّهُ خَلِيفَتِي عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ And Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who will take care of every one of you on my behalf if I am not around. Meaning that he will, he's the one who will establish the proofs and the evidences. My brothers, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he warned that the Dajjal will appear after people leave his mentioning on the manabir. After they get busy with other matters and they forget about this great fitna that will come. My brothers and sisters in Islam, there are great signs that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about prior to the Dajjal appearing. From these signs is a great, firstly there will be a peace between the Muslims and the Romans, who are the people of the West. And they will be fighting together a third enemy. And when they are victorious, the Romans, one of the Romans, will praise the cross. And he will say the cross has granted us victory. So the believer will break the cross and he will say Allah is the one who granted us victory. And they will fight. And there will be a group of Muslims 
among the Romans, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said they will all be, be killed in the path of Allah azza wa jal. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam affirmed for them the shahada. That they will all be martyred in the cause of Allah azza wa jal. And then it is mentioned that the Romans will prepare for a war. A great war. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described it as al-malhama. Al-malhama, it is described to, me, to be according to their terminologies too as the Armageddon. It's the one in which it's a great battle between the truth and falsehood. A great one. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described there will be a malhama. And then they will be preparing and they will go to an area in Syria near Halab. And then an army will come out from Medina. And the Romans will be much greater in numbers comparing to the Muslims. So every one of them, the Muslims, here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that this army will be into three groups. The one that is defeated by withdrawing because of their fear. The other one that is martyred and they are the best of martyrs. And then another one that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described that they are the ones who will be granted victory. Now, in other hadith, it describes that they will give the pledge to one another to fight till death or victory. Because of the state that Muslims were going through due to their fear of their enemy. Due to their fear of their enemy, there will be people who are apostating. So they will give the pledge to one another that they will fight until death or be victorious. And stop here for a moment and think with me, my brothers, and reflect. How Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is describing that the victory is coming to the believers by those who are fighting in his cause, by those who are not afraid to stand in the path of Allah azza wa jal. And this is something that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described his nation by when he said, وَلَا يَزَالُ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْ أُمَّتِي ظَاهِرِينَ عَلَى الْحَقِّ لا يضرهم من خذلهم ولا من خالفهم حتى يأتي أمر الله. And there will always be a group of my nation who are upholding the truth, fighting for the truth. It doesn't bother them who opposes them or who disagrees with them until the command of Allah Azza wa Jal comes to them. And this is a situation now where you're seeing them. So you notice they will exist at all times. The terrorists will exist at all times. Those who fight in the cause of Allah will exist at all times. And it doesn't bother them, bother them who disagrees. So the hadith describes that they will give the pledge to one another, that they will fight until death and, or until they are victor, victorious. And the first day will come and they will fight fiercely and bravely until the evening comes. The whole day will pass and they are fighting and fighting and those who died, died, and those who did not die will continue their mission. Until the second day comes, and the same thing happens. And the third day comes, and the same thing will happen. And then the fourth day, the victory and the support will come to them from the Muslims. They will rush towards them from different directions. And they will all go towards where the battle is happening. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he described it there, that they will be victorious. And they will move on then to a city, which one side of it is towards the land, and the other is towards the sea. The ulama here differ. Is this Constantinople? Is this talking about Istanbul, a second opening that will happen? Or is it talking about another area? It's an area of debate between the scholars. And, mo and the recent scholars who went on to explore lands, they believe that it's an area in Italy. It's an area in Italy. And after they enter that area, they will open it with the takbir and the tahleel. They will not have to fight. All they will do is the takbir and the tahleel. There are reports that say this is Constantinople, Istanbul. Others say otherwise. But what we know that this city would be conquered with the takbir and the tahleel. They will do it first and then the first side 
will be opened and conquered. And then they do it again and both sides will be opened. Now while they have their swords hanged up, it will be a devastating state. Because out of every 100, one person will be left, according to these reports, which I have verified. And Allah Ta'ala, they seem to be authentic. Since trustworthy, reliable scholars have passed this on to us. But they will not be desiring any more wealth. And they will not be desiring anything because every one of them has lost so much from his family that he's pretty much one of the only ones left in the family. So he will not be in that desire for it. While they are in the state where they are dividing their beauties and their swords are hanging on the trees of the olive, the olive trees. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us that there will be a caller who is the shaytan who would call out that a Dajjal has appeared. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that 10 of the best of the warriors will jump onto their horses and they will race all the way towards the area which was said that, that he appeared. And Allahu alam, as the reports state, it is Khurasan. And the area specifically is an area in Iran. Wallahu wa ta'ala a'lam. So they will rush there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stated, I know their names. And I know the name of their fathers. And I know the, even the color of their horses. They are the best of warriors at that time. And subhanallah, look at this praise from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to people who are in such a state that they are careless to the dunya and so cautious and worried about their families that they will rush and leave behind their dunya towards the lands where they believe he's there. Of course, Rasulullah did command us not to go looking for him. And we're going to come to this. Now, that call at the beginning was a lie. It was the call of the shaitan. But Allah Azza wa Jal allows that call to become true. And the man will appear who is known as a Dajjal. al Masih al-Dajjal. When, when he says it, Allah will allow it to really happen. When the shaitan says it, it will happen for real this time. And the area, the hadith states, was in Khurasan. Specifically, they went down to a tribe or an area called Asbahan. And in Iran today, there is an area which is not occupied by any other than the Jews. And they are the Jews of Asbahan. And it's called Yahudiya. And they have the belief of a prophet who they believe was Isa that is going to appear from there because they disbelieved in Isa from the first place. So they have the thought of the coming of Christ. But in reality, it's the Antichrist. And the Christians have the thought, by the way, of the coming of the Christ again to give them victory. But in reality, it's not the Christ that they believe in. And the only ones who have the correct faith and belief in this they are the Muslims. And specifically, when I say the Muslims, I mean specifically and exclusively the ones who uphold the Aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, not the Shia. Because the Shia have a different belief towards these two. Specifically, we mean this by this the Sunnah. Now, my brothers, the meaning of the word Masih, the word Masih, it has the meaning of the one who he's, has been wiped out. And this is the meaning of Masih, it's been wiped. And this is the description of a Dajjal, that he is, one of his eyes is actually wiped out. And it's a sign that was given to distinguish him. And it means in the language, the wiped or smooth or braided. And he will be blind or defective in one eye. Or it was said also in Masih because he covers the whole land. He will travel all over the earth and co cover every area of the earth with his trial and test. Except for two areas, Mecca and Medina, two cities. And this was an opinion, however, the most correct, Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, is the first one, 
and that is it's due to his defection in his eye. And there's room to say both, by the way. And it's not one of those contradictory meanings. So long that we, go, we don't go on to deny what Rasulullah has described from descriptions about him. Because there are people who describe that Masih here doesn't mean he's got one eye. No, it's a one eye. Masih, one eye has been covered. As to the word a dajjal it's an expression, the word Dajjal is taken from the expression Dajjal al-Ba'ir, which means he smeared the camel, referring to when they cover, co co uh, cover the camel with tar. When you cover something, you call it Dajjal. And a Dajjal was called like that because, because he covers the truth with falsehood. So he was called Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Now Rasulullah gave us accurate descriptions about a Dajjal. And it's clearly stated in the Ahadith that he is a human being. He is a human who has been described with characteristics that humans have, but it's defected. And I will come across that. And also Rasulullah he did not leave any area that he could describe except that he told us about him so that we can recognize his features. From these attributes, it was described that he will be a young man with a ruddy complexion, Ahmad. He's white, but with that reddish color to his face and to his skin. Short, short, with thick curly hair and a wide forehead and a broad upper chest, blind or defective in the right eye. This eye will be neither prominent nor sunken and will look like a floating grape. A floating grape. Have you seen how a grape looks like when it's floating? It looks like that. Another one of these characteristics that has been given to him is that he's described to be Jasim. Jasim means he's big. But how could we combine between a character that is big but short? Meaning he's wide, he's broad. <coughs> His legs have been described by Rasulullah. He said, Afhaj. Afhaj in the Arabic language describes the one who there is space between his thighs. So he, his walking is not normal. And also it describes the one whose legs are curved. Have you seen a child in the early stages, how at times they got that curve? Similar to that. He's got that description with his legs. And the hadith are there, which are authentic to prove this. And wallahi, just for the fee of me going through too much hadith, to the extent that I won't be able to cover the topic, I chose not to go into the details of the hadith due to it being something found easily and deemed to be authentic. And my descriptions have been taken from the authentic ahadith about him. From the descriptions that was given also about him, is that he is someone who does not have any children. He does not have any children. Again, this is another character of deficiency. Another description given to him that proves his deficiency. And a Dajjal will be someone who has a life and he dies. And to prove it later on, we're going to hear it, that he will be killed by Al-Masih Ibn Maryam, which indicates he's got a life. Unlike some people who say that he's not a human being, it's a system or something. No, we're talking about the Dajjal who is a human who has a life, who will die. And he will be killed. Now, where would the Dajjal appear from? The hadith state, as I have said to you before, that he will appear from Khurasan, from, from among the Jews of Asfahan. Then he will travel the earth and will leave no city without entering it. There's not a city he will not enter it, apart from Mecca and Medina which he will not be able to enter because of the angels that are guarding it. 
According to the hadith of Fatima bin Qais, Rasulullah, he was described to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he will emerge from the direction of the Syrian Sea. Rasulullah described that he will come from the Syrian Sea. And then he said, no. And Rasulullah was allowed here to do his ishtihad. He said, no, from the Yemeni. And then he said, rather from the east. And he pointed towards the east. And this hadith has been narrated by an Imam Muslim. Now I told you that, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us that he will not enter Mecca and Medina. And also what has been mentioned in Al Masjid al Aqsa, according to the hadith collected by Imam Ahmad, and the mosque of Sayyidina. He will not enter that one too, according to that authentic report collected by Imam Ahmad. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he described that in front of the gates of Mecca and Medina, there will be angels at each gate guarding it with their, and he even described with their solid sparkling swords. So he will not be able to enter. And I am going to speak to you about his fitna in detail because it is something that we should be aware of. So he will not be able to enter. However, he will stand in an area where it's barren. There's no, there's no fruits, there's no plants that could plant from it. And the Medina will shake three times. And out of Medina will come the hypocrites from the males and the females. And he will go on to the mountain of Uhud. And this has been stated in the authentic reports. He will rise and go on to the mountain of Uhud. And he will say, there is the palace of Ahmed. هذا قصر أحمد. And he's describing here the Prophet, the Prophet's mosque. Now stop here for a moment, my brothers, and ask the question: Has the Prophet's mosque always looked like a palace? If you go there today, it looks like a palace. And even from space, if you were to be taking a picture from space. It looks like a white palace. And the Dajjal here described it as a white palace even. In another report it stated, a white palace. And he will not be able to enter. Now the followers of a Dajjal, and for stop for a moment and reflect. The ones who come out of Medina and Mecca are the ones who are described to be hypocrites. And that teaches you, my dear brother and sister in Islam, that no person who is free from true faith can survive his fitna. Don't think that you are able to trick a Dajjal. You are not able to fight him or cheat him and conceal while you look like a Muslim and, look, and inside you're a kafir. You cannot be like that. Or have a shaky faith, a weak Iman, and be able to stand his fitna. Now his followers, the followers of a Dajjal, they will be from among the Jews, and Persians, and Turks, and a mixture of other people, mostly Bedouins and women. Now stop here for a moment and think about it. The Jews, due to their nature of having hatred towards the Arabs, and he was known, he's known to be from the Jews, by the way. And the Persians and the Turks, the ulama have stated reasons. I'm not saying all of them, but they will be from them. And also a mixture of people, mostly Bedouins and women. Bedouins because of their ignorance. And mainly you can say all those who are described by ignorance can be affected by him very easily. And women, specifically women, because of his ability to have them change altogether with what he can provide them from treasures and from the worldly gifts. When they see it and that I have the Iman, they will be taken away with his fitna. And I'm going to talk about his fitna as I said to you before. Now my brothers, and also these have all been reported by authentic, uh, found in authentic ahadith collected by Imam Muslim and others, Al-Tirmidhi, even Al-Bukhari and others. 
Now, what is the fitna of a Dajjal? What is this fitna that's so great and so dangerous? This man will claim to be God. This man will claim to be God. And you may ask the question, how could anyone believe him? How could anyone believe that God is a human being? The answer is clear. Due to them not knowing who is God, due to their ignorance, due to their state that they are living where they are so tightly to this dunya, that when they see the dunya opening up to them, they have, it's very difficult to resist him and say no. So he claims to be God. At the beginning, the reports state that he will claim to be a prophet. And then he will claim and that, that there is no other prophet after him. And then he will claim to be God. Now from his trials and tests, is that he will have paradise and hell. And Rasulullah he described it clearly that he will have a paradise and hell with him. But his paradise will be a hell and his hell will be a paradise. And this is narrated by the Imam Muslim. And he even describes that paradise looks like it's white. While the hellfire, you can see it, it's, it's flowing rivers from fire. Yani, the hadiths are clear about it. And he will come to the person and he will tell him to believe in him or go to hell. And Rasulullah he stated that when this happens, that a person should lower his head and drink from it, for verily it is cool, talking about the fire. And that his fire in reality is paradise. But the challenge here, my brothers and sisters, is that you are going to deny what your eyes see with that which you believe in. And this is not a test for anyone to survive from unless he has firm belief in Allah Azza wa Jal. And by the way, this test happens in life frequently, consistently, but not on that level where you see it in front of with your eyes. Paradise and hell. But in life we have that challenge where you see in front of you that which to you it's good. To you, it's nothing wrong with it. But Allah Azza wa Jalla said it's bad, it's evil, it's dangerous, stay away from it. This test happens on a daily basis. If you are not someone who has that belief in what Allah has commanded, and what Allah has described, and what Rasulullah has described, then how would you survive the greater test of seeing in front of you paradise and hell and being able to resist that? This is not a test that a person who does not have the faith or belief can survive. He will go, and his hadiths are clear and authentic. Rasulullah he said that during his time, he will, there will be, he will stay for 40 days. One day like a year. And this is a fitna, this is a great trial. Something huge is happening here. A universal change with the existence of this creature, this person. So one day like a year, and one day like a month, and one day like a week, and the rest of the days are normal. He will travel with the wind. You know the clouds? You know how it travels? He will travel like that. He will travel so fast, and so quick, and so swift that he will be able to cover all the areas of the earth. Now tell me, how could a person really here be in that state where he says, I disbelieve in this person who is dealing with the shayateen and the jinn, and I believe in Allah Azza wa Jal. Unless he really knows that what Allah Azza wa Jal has described is the truth. From the trials and the tests that he will come with, is that he will go to an area where its people are poor and there's no vegetation and their animals are weak 
and he will command them to believe in him and they will believe he will order the sky to rain and it will rain and he will order the, the, the ground the earth to bring out its crops and it will bring out its crops and the animals will go on to become healthy and fit better than what they were before and this is something that they are seeing with their own eyes someone is commanding the sky and the earth and as a result they are responding it's really not his power it's the test of Allah as they were to mankind at that time and he will go to the people and also to other people and he will command them to believe and if they disbelieve in him he, the earth will become barren and dry and they will be in a state of difficulty and hardship. Now, we stop here for a moment and we reflect on the state of mankind. Isn't this sometimes the state of people when it comes to them dealing with the command of Allah? Where they prefer the haram in favor of earthly returns. How many of the Muslim countries, how many of the countries that are Muslim lands have been opened to the kuffar to become a play out for them? Why? Because they want returns. They want blessings from them. Isn't this a very, very great danger? And isn't this a test that people have failed already? How many people have refused the command of Allah in their life and rejected it in favor of what? Of being well off, in peace and in security. Individually or collectively. How many of the lands of the Muslims were like that too? Where they were refusing to uphold the command of Allah Azza wa Jal in favor of what? Security, peace, provisions, and so on. So subhanAllah, how people are feigning the test even before the Dajjal appears. How many of our sisters, our Muslim sisters whom we love and whom we care for, have refused the command of Allah with their hijabs in hope that they will get that future husband who will knock on her door, who is well off, who is educated and who's going to make her happy. She's refusing the command of Allah Azza wa Jal in return for an earthly gain. Tell me, my brothers, how would this person be saved with such a mentality? We ask Allah to protect them. And we ask Allah to aid them and help them. And this goes on to many of us. Many of us live this state on a daily basis. And yet we have not faced the real big test of a Dajjal. How many of our brothers refuse to pray at their work workplace? Thinking that, well, if I'm going to pray, I'm going to end up missing out on my job. I'm going to get fired. I'm going to end up on the street. Isn't this exactly what the Dajjal is going to test you with, my dear brother and sister in Islam? Isn't it the Dajjal going to come to you with the test of challenging what you believe in? in favor of something in return. A Dajjal will go to an area that is ruined and he will command it to bring out its treasures. He will command the land to bring out its treasures and its treasures will come out and it will follow him like the group of bees. Have you seen how the great groups of bees travel? You try to dodge bees. Well, when you got treasures coming towards you and you're in that state of weakness, my brother, how are you going to be able to flee from that? From the tests and the trials of a Dajjal is that he will go to a person and he will say to him, believe in me. He will say, no, I disbelieve in you. He says, what if I bring back to your father and your mother? What if I bring back to you your father and your mother? He says, go and do it. He says, he will say to him, where is the grave of your father and your mother? 
So he will take him there. And he will command them to rise. But in reality, it's two shayateen that are rising, pretending that they are the parents coming back to life. And they will say to him, believe in him, follow him. Now again, you might ask the question, how could someone believe this? Jahad, my brothers, ignorance. How many people go to the graves today and seek from the graves protection? How many people go to the graves and sacrifice in front of it? How many people seek protection with a rock? And how many people seek protection in human beings? In that which only Allah, from that which only Allah can protect you from. How could a person then stand the challenge of seeing his parents, his father and his mother coming back to life right in front of him when his faith is already defeated, thinking that the graves or the saints can protect him and help him. He will go towards, when he's, while he's at Medina, while he's at Medina, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, a young man will come out from Medina, doing other than that which is the norm. Normally Rasulullah, he said to us, when you know that he's around, flee from him, run away. Because the reality is that you might think your iman is strong. You might think you're, you're very tough with your iman, as many of our brothers think today. Without any learning, without any application, without nothing, they think it's all in the heart. Without even wanting to take that path of really learning and applying. Without establishing the creed that is solid in the hearts. Rasulullah said that one of you, scribing, he said one of you could go to him thinking that he's got faith and you will be deceived. He said, so flee from him. The command was clear, flee from him, run away. Run away. Wherever you know he's found, run away. But while he's on the outskirts of Medina, a man will come out to him. And this man is a person of solid, firm faith in Allah Azza wa Jal. And the guards of the Dajjal will stop him. They will tell him, where are you going? He, said, he would say, I am going to the Dajjal. They said, to him, they, they said, let's kill him. And they were about to kill him. Until one of them called out. He said, didn't God command us not to kill anyone until we pass it through by him? So they went and presented him in front of a Dajjal. And he looks at him and he says to people straight away, He is a Dajjal. He is the false Messiah that Rasulullah has warned us from. So he will be laid down on the floor and he will be beaten and beaten and beaten on his stomach and on his back severely and he will be firm on his creed. And by the way, my brothers, these tests and challenges, do not think that you can survive it if it's not Allah's aid on your side. If Allah Azzawajal is not protecting you and helping you at that time. And then he will continue to disbelieve so the Dajjal will command for him to be cut into two pieces. So he will cut him into two pieces. And then he will walk and he will say to him, stand up. And he will rise. He said, do you believe in me now? He said, I've only increased in disbelief in you. You are a Dajjal. So a Dajjal here wants to kill him for real this time. So he comes to cut his neck. And Allah Azza wa Jal will have copper in the section where he's cutting, so he's not able to cut. So they will throw him into the fire. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he described that he is the greatest of men. The greatest of martyrs at that time. Because of him doing the hujjah, establishing the hujjah of Allah azza wa jal. And that is the evidences that are clear, that are known to everyone. And by the way, this is the state of the truthful men in our times today too. And throughout times. They are people who establish the hujjah, the evidences and the proofs, even on the expense of being killed. So at all times you find Allah will send people like that, establishing evidences and proofs.
so that no one can blame Allah later on and say that I did not have the clear evidences from you. One thing I forgot to mention before, which is a very important point, and that is that Jan has written on his forehead, Kafara. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he described that every Muslim can read it. Every Muslim can read it. Yaqra'uhu kullu Muslim. Every Muslim read it, whether he knows how to read or he doesn't know how to read. Whether he's an Arab or whether he's uh, Australian or whether he's Fijian or whether no matter where he comes from or if he doesn't know how to read altogether. He's an Ummi altogether. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he described that he will be able to read it on his forehead. Now my dear brothers, at the Dajjal, his trial and test is such a great one to the extent that men will have to even chain their wives. The narration states that the ladies will be so affected by him that the man will be fearing so for his wife so much that he will tie her up to Sariyatul Bayt, to the pole in his house, out of the great fear he has towards her following him. That's how far it went. That's how far it goes. We're talking about someone here who has with him things that are abnormal, they're not normal. And people due to their weak Iman or no Iman are being taken away by it. So quick and so easy. My brothers, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he described to us that the Dajjal will taste death and he will experience it. Now while the Muslims are in Baytul Maqdis, Baytul Maqdis is going to be in the hands of the Muslims prior. And Al-Mahdi, the most correct you, is the Mahdi will appear prior. The Mahdi will appear before the Dajjal appears. Now they will be praying in the mosque. And while they are praying, in, while, they, sorry, while they are in the mosque, the Masih Isa ibn Maryam will be descending placing his hands on two angels. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described that he will say, go down at Al-Manaratul Bayda, which is described to be at Al-Masjid Al-Umawi. And they believe that that's where there's a minaret there specifically where he's going to come down. Allah ta'ala alam if this is really true or not. But what we know for sure that Rasulullah did say Al-Manaratul Bayda, which is in Dimashq. Now when he comes down, he was described that his sweat is like the pearls and his breath it will destroy every kafir and his breath is as far as he can see authentic reports so when he descends he will head toward al-masjid al-maqdis and he will enter it now at that time the imam will recognize isa ibn maryam so he will step back al-tahqari he's turning back and he says to him to leave. And he calls him by Ruhullah, the Spirit of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he refuses it. The Iqamah has been made for you. And he would lead while Isa ibn Maryam is behind. And after they finish their prayer of Al Fajr, and notice here the description of the men that we are talking about. They are not people who abandon their salah, they are not people who are in a state of defeat rather they are in a state of strength in Iman so after they finish their prayer Isa ibn Maryam he will open the gate and there will be a Dajjal with 70,000 soldiers and the reports describe alayhim al-tayalisa alayhim al-tayalisa tayalisa is described to be the clothing that is one piece from here to the top, to, to the bottom. 70,000 of them from the Jews. And he says, Isa ibn Maryam would say to him, I have something for you that I have to deliver. And as soon as the Dajjal sees him, he would melt like salt 
in water. And that's how fast he can move. And they, the Mujahideen, they, the Muwahideen, will go with the Masih Isa ibn Maryam to fight. And, they, and he will, Isa ibn Maryam will continue to chase him with his sword until he finds him and he gets him at the place called Bab Lud, which is an area known in Palestine today. And he will behead him. He will execute him. And the believers will see his blood on his, on his sword. And that is where the hadith states that there will not be a tree or a stone except that it will say, Ya Muslim, Ya Abdullah, Wara'i Yahudi, Ta'ala Faqtul. There the trees will stand with the believers. And I'll, show you, I'll tell you one thing, my brothers. Allah will never forsake the believers at any time. Never. Allah will never let them go. And He will even get this creation in which you and I see it to be solid creation that cannot do nothing. He will get, the, get it there to aid the believer in the path that is pleasing to Allah. No matter what path it is. Allah Azza wa Jal, He will help. وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ and whosoever fears Allah, Allah will give him a way out. And he will provide him from where he never expected. And whosoever puts his trust in Allah, then Allah is sufficient for him. Now there, that's where the trees and the stones will call out. And say, behind me is a Jew, come and kill him. Except for one, which is called Al-Gharqad. Which is called Al-Gharqad. And believe it or not, the Jews believe in this. To the extent that they are planting this in abundance. They are planting it in abundance. Because they know that Rasulullah has said the truth. And they know that the day will come. But again, the believers will find a way to deal with the gharqat. Don't worry my brothers. No tree is going to stand in their way. And that's when the believers will go to fight them. And they will not leave any one of those soldiers alive. Not one of them would be left alive. And Allah Azza wa Jal, by this, has established His promise, and that is to save the believers and to protect them. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to seek refuge with Allah from a Dajjal. In our prayers, every single salat, we were taught that we do not leave this to the extent that even some of the ulama, such as Ibn Hazm, was on the view that leaving it invalidates your salah. But of course, it's not the view of the majority of the scholars, all of them. However, you will find that they will emphasize on it collectively that you have to say it. Do not leave it. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhabi jahannam wa min adhabi al-qabr wa min fitnati al-mahya wal mamat وَمِن شَرِّ فِتْنَةِ الْمَسِيحِ الدَّجَّالِ Every prayer Rasulullah taught us this. That we seek refuge with Allah from the Dajjal. Every prayer. Because, because of the great trials that will happen when He is around. I ask you now the question. I ask you the question. How do you guide yourself today if a Dajjal will appear? Wallahi al-Azim, I am not exaggerating. The ulama of Ahl sunnah do you have a view that the time of a Dajjal is ready? Really, there's nothing from the signs that withhold prior to him coming now. Like if Rasulullah was even in doubt that he exists in his time, even to the extent Rasulullah was thinking that Ibn Sayyad, one of the Jew, young Jewish boys, was, he, was the Dajjal. And he was trying to find out, even to the extent that companions even saw him in the hadith of Tamim ibn Aws al-Dari, where they went out on a trip in the ocean and in the sea, and they were taken off course to an island. And at that island, these people were Christians originally. They ended up meeting a man who claimed to be a Dajjal. And when they returned to Rasulullah, they all believed. And Rasulullah gathered the companions to say that I have today news that was given to me by them 
which is exactly as I have described to you. So there are reports that say that he's alive today. And even Rasulullah said, he is in the east. He is in the east, indicating that he's around. But let's say, Akhi, this is a view from the ulama, which could be explained in the hadith, which they explain the hadith in a different way. Even then, isn't it something scary to you, my brothers? How do you guard yourself against fitna? How do you guard it? Are you awaiting for the signs of Allah to happen in order for you to be in that state of strength? Are you awaiting for the angel to be there in front of you for you to be in that state of strength? What are you doing with your wives? What are you doing with your children? I ask you this question and I tell you my brothers, it's a very important question. <coughs> now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught us how to guard ourselves against the Dajjal. From it is to have solid faith. When he said that the sign will be read on the forehead, it was read by who? By the Muslim. And notice the hadith where he said that when Medina would shake, who will come out? The hypocrites. Indicating what? True Muslims. True Muslims. Not Muslims by label. Not Muslims by title. But Muslims who are truthful. Firm believers. Who are not weak in front of the small tests. People who don't give up in front of the small tests. Also from the, from the hadith. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us how to be protected from a Dajjal is the hadith where he said to memorize the first 10 ayat from Surah Al-Kahf and the last 10 ayat from Surah Al-Kahf. Either, sorry, either the first 10 or the last 10. Now I ask you, how much time have you spent to memorize Quran? These words when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to say them, he said, if you meet him, read upon him. Read in front of him the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf. The beginning of it. And Wallahi, imagine we're in that state, my brother. And we see how we're going to respond. We haven't memorized nothing from the Quran. Nothing. How are we going to stand? So the first ten and the last ten. Also, there's a hadith which states that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that reading Surah Al-Kahf would be a light from one Jumu'ah to the other Jumu'ah. <coughs> from one Jumu'ah to the other Jumu'ah. So reading Surah Al-Kahf is also a reason why you'll be protected and you'll be shown, you'll be given light from Allah Azza wa Jal when the Dajjal does appear. <coughs> also, my dear brothers, from the ways to protect yourself, if you are able to be in Mecca and Medina, if you are, if you are of those who have the ability, now or then, to travel to Mecca and Medina, and to be in that area. My brothers and sisters, I conclude with one message. I conclude with one important message. And that is, guard yourselves. Not because of the appearance of a Dajjal. Not because of him. But guard yourself because of what awaits us in front of Allah on the day of resurrection. يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة Oh you who believe guard yourselves and your families from a fire in which this fuel is people and stones do it because of that. Do it because this is the purpose behind your creation. Do it because you have no other way to succeed in this world. Do it because at the end of the day, the one who has found Allah Azza wa Jal will be protected. And while the one who does not find Allah Azza wa Jal, he is the one who has been forsaken. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to guide you all and to protect you all and your families. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us of those who are truthful. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to use us in the path that pleases Him the most. To make us obedient Muslims who are steadfast on His command on a daily basis. To make us of those who unite with our families 
on the path of goodness, on the path of that which brings us closer.